Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for our workers training meeting today. Thank you for your people, all our workers, our leaders, our ministers, pastors, overseers, everyone here, everyone, everywhere connected. We're asking, Lord, that you grant us real passion for your work in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that our work, our involvement, everything we do, whichever section, we pray, Lord, that will have such an impact that will turn the lives of people around for the better in Jesus' name. Keep us, Lord, as kingdom citizens of heaven. And we pray, Lord, that our ministry, our work, our preaching, exhortation, and exposition of the word will check up people, convict people, lead them on their knees, and lead them to be connected with you, to be converted and consecrated, committed unto the Lord as kingdom citizens in Jesus' name. Use us, Lord, for your glory and preserve the souls of the people we're ministering to. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 12. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then in verse 13, it says, But now, he had said in verse 12, at that time, before we knew Christ and before we heard the word of salvation, before the grace of God was exposed and expounded unto us, and before we got that grace and we held on to that grace and it brought change, transformation in our lives. At that time, we were without God, without Christ without salvation and without hope and now in verse 13 it says but now in christ jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nice made near reconciled by the blood of christ in verse 14 for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle of the middle wall of partition between us a partition a wall of partition before between us and god holy god righteous god heavenly god and we humans who are earthly and sinful and ungodly but now he broke down the middle wall of partition between us and god for we are reconciled unto god by the lord jesus christ not only that if you are reconciled with God, and I am reconciled with God, you and I are also reconciled together. If the Jews are reconciled with God, and the Gentiles are reconciled with God, then the Jews and the Gentiles are reconciled together. And the middle wall of partition between us, that middle wall is broken down. If you arch a wall of partition, between you and myself, between myself and you. If you are truly born again, if you are truly a child of God, the middle wall of partition between you and I is not broken down because we're reconciled one to the other. And then he tells us in verse 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments, it says, contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace between the Gentile and the Jew, because both are reconciled to God, then he makes us one. The Gentile world, the Jewish world, 
as they are born again are connected with the lord the god of heaven through christ our savior then we become one new man then making peace and in verse 16 it tells us it says and that he might reconcile both unto god in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby verse 17 it says in verse 17 and he came and preached peace to you which were far off gentiles and to them which were nice the jews in verse 18 then it says for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father verse 19 then says now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of god verse 20 in verse 20 and a built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone verse 21 in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22 then tells us in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. As we look at all those verses, it talks about God the holy righteous god in heaven it talks about christ our redeemer our savior our mediator and the means of our reconciliation with the god of heaven then it talks about the people of the world the jews and the gentiles who are reconciled to god and reconciled to one another and then he talks about the character the characteristics of the people who are no more foreigners to the kingdom they're no more strangers in the kingdom they are now fellow citizens with you and i and with the saints of the living god that's what we're looking at today the character and the characteristics of kingdom citizens the citizens of the kingdom those who are born again into the kingdom and those whose lives have been totally transformed they are now in the kingdom referred to as kingdom citizens how do you know them how do you recognize them how do you observe their lives their character and know that truly without any shadow of doubt that is a kingdom citizen their characteristics and the marks by which we know them the evident things that happen in their lives that you know that here are the kingdom citizens three things we're looking at in the message number one the fellow citizens were saints in the holy kingdom number two the foreigners and the strangers in the heartless kingdom Number three, the foundation of our security in the heavenly kingdom. Number one, the fellow citizens were saints in the holy kingdom. Look at that again in Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints fellow citizens not with the sinners with the saints and of the household of god then he tells us in exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6 exodus 19 verse 5 now therefore if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine look at verse 6 the first part there and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation a kingdom of, of the 
of uh, a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. In First Peter chapter two verse nine, First Peter chapter two verse nine is talking about the kingdom citizens and what we are now as people who have been reconciled unto God converted by Christ and we're now members of the household of God the household of faith first Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 9 but she a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people is describing those who are kingdom citizens it says we're a royal priesthood that means a kingdom of priests and then it says and holy nation the people who are gathered together inside a large nation inside an earthly nation and yet because we have been reconciled with God we are an holy nation a peculiar people because we are not walking we are not living by the principles of the world we are living by the principle of the kingdom of God and it says he said this are calling and this is the reason we are fellow citizens with the Lord so that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous lights it tells us in, uh, we're looking at three things here and uh, the fellow citizens with the saints in the holy kingdom three things number one the call and the cleansing of sinners for the kingdom number two the calling and the character of saints in the kingdom number three our consecration and commitment to the service of the kingdom look at number one number one the call and the cleansing of sinners for the kingdom it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 Ephesians 2 13 but now in Christ Jesus you were sometimes far off a mage near nice by the blood of Christ we were far away as sinners and Christ came to die for us and he shed his blood for us and now because he calls us calling us to repentance and we responded unto him he now brings us near unto God by the blood the blood that blots out our transgression the blood that washes us whiter than snow the blood that takes away all the stain of sin away from our heart it says he has not made us nice by the blood of christ that means then it's not by your self effort by your trying by turning over a new leaf and by changing your outward expression outward appearance you actually come to Christ so that he can cleanse you and wash you and blot away all your sins and link you up with the heavenly father that you are now reconciled unto him and you are brought near by the blood of Christ in verse 20, in verse 14 it says for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us that middle wall of partition was so thick that nobody could make any door any opening to cross over to the other side only Christ because he is God only Christ because he is the perfect man the perfect God becoming a perfect man that he will go to Calvary and die for us you remember when he was on the cross that the veil in the temple very thick also everything was split so as to illustrate that that middle wall of partition very thick very strong impossible to be broken through that his death 
is the only thing that will break down that middle wall of partition. And because that wall of partition between us and God had been broken down, now we can come to Christ and say we're getting to God. A mediator, the redeemer, the Messiah that has now cleared the way for you and I to be of the Holy God. In verse 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making a peace then in verse 16 it says and that he might reconcile both unto god that he christ our savior the final sacrifice and the only one that could make the way for you to get to the kingdom of God that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross have been slain the enmity thereby then in verse 17 and he came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were near in verse 18 it says for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father you notice there the father the son the spirit and he's talking about the different uh, attributes and the different activities of the father separate the son separate and the holy spirit separate the holy trinity the trinitarian activity that brings in our total redemption then he tells us the conclusion in verse 19 now therefore therefore because of what he has done therefore because we come to him therefore because we leave the world of darkness and we come to christ the light of the world therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of god how did that happen look at first john chapter 1 verse 9 first john chapter 1 verse 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness you're coming from outside you come to the door of the grace of God and you knock at that door of grace and Christ is there he opens the door he forgives your sin and he cleanses you look at verse 7 in verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light you've come out of darkness and you want to show forth now his marvelous light and because you are not born again you are a child of god here is your character you're walking in the light here is the characteristic and the mark of your life you're walking in the light as he is in the light then it says we have fellowship one with another that middle wall of partition is broken down between us we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from how many sins all sin and no sin will remain in your life in jesus name let's look at number two here number two is the calling and character of saints in the kingdom now we're in the kingdom we're born again into the kingdom we're reconciled to the god of the kingdom what's a calling like and what's a character like in romans chapter 1 verse 7 it says to all that be in rome beloved of god called to be saints called to be saints called to live as saints to talk as saints to behave as saints to work as saints 
and to move on in this world as saints of God, whether we're at home as saints, in the office as saints, we're traveling as saints, we come to church as saints, we're living for him and living for the kingdom as saints. Our behavior, our character, our disposition, our thinking, our planning, everything we do, everything we think about, our interaction with other people, and our interaction very int with intimate people, our interaction with the people of the land, anywhere we are, here is our calling. And whatever we're doing, anytime, we're conscious of that fact. Are we praying as saints? Are we helping other people as saints? Are we living anywhere for a good purpose as saints? It says, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you always conscious about that call in your life? As you relate with other people, as you act, in any situation, as a work, in the church, outside the church, in the marketplace, anywhere, as you relate with the opposite sex, you're a man, as you relate with a woman, with a girl, you're a woman, as you relate with men, with girls, in every relationship, everything we do, in the thoughts of our heart, we are called to be saints, and we're conscious of that every time. And then he tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1, Ephesians 5 verse 1, be ye therefore followers of God godly, be ye therefore followers of God you know the attributes of God, you know the character of God, and you are conscious every time that as a citizen of the kingdom, that everything you do, everything you express, you therefore be as followers of God, as their children. In verse 2, it says, and walk in love, not hatred, walk in love not in jealousy, walk in love, not in envy, walk in love, not in the lust of the flesh or the pride of life, walk in love. Here is the character, here are the characteristics of the saints of God in the kingdom. It says we we'll walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Then it says in verse 3, in verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, as becometh saints. First Thessalonians chapter 3, reading from verse 12. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. And then in verse 13, it says, to the end, for the purpose, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even as even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all he says, number three, in number three, we're looking at the consecration, a consecration and commitment to the service of the kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28, wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot 
demote the kingdoms of this world are moved from one to the other somebody is in church now and then after some years another person comes in charge sometimes it's the roman empire and the romans are in charge sometimes it's the grecian empire and the Christians and church. Sometimes in the Middle Persian Empire, they keep on changing because the kingdom of the world cannot be on somebody's shoulder all through its life. But now the kingdom of God, that kingdom which cannot be moved, and Christ is the king, and because the king of kings, his kingdom abides forever, and we want to receive the title, the privilege, the opportunity of reigning with him in that kingdom. It says, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, let us have grace. I thought we had grace already. Yes, we had grace at the time of salvation. And that door of grace was opened unto us. We had great redemption at Christ's expense. We had grace. But that's the initial grace. But now, after we come into the kingdom, let us have grace what kind of grace is that that is guided righteousness as converts emancipated he has emancipated us already when the kingdom he has broken down the middle wall of partition and yet we need grace it's not that we need grace to enter in now entering in getting saved every sunday getting saved every at every crusade already we're saved but we need grace the grace that is granted unto us righteousness at christ's emancipation he has emancipated us and now we have grace and more grace and more grace that's why you find grace be multiplied unto you grace be given unto you grace and peace and the mercy of god we need that grace every time so that we can live in righteousness all the days of our lives wherefore we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear with reverence and godly fear filial fear that will fear him we don't live a careless life because we're saved by grace 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 and we never go beyond that initial grace to the higher grace it says that we may serve god acceptably with reverence and godly fear colossians chapter 3 verse 23 in colossians chapter 3 verse 23 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily now you have come into the kingdom and you are consecrated and committed to the service of the kingdom it says and whatsoever ye do you do heartily you do lovingly you do wholeheartedly you do with everything every skill you've got it says do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. As to the Lord and not unto men. Are you leading house fellowship? As to the Lord and not unto men. Are you evangelizing? As to the Lord and not unto men. Are you calling sinners out of the world that they should come into the kingdom? You do it with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, actually, lovingly, wholeheartedly, as to the Lord and not unto men. You are coming to attend the workers' training 
there a service as to the Lord and not unto men. You have heard the word of God and you go back home to practice it. It is not who said it, it is not who preached it, because it's the word of God. You do it, you comply as to the Lord and not unto men. In verse 24, it says in verse 24, knowing that of the Lord he shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, the foreigners and the strangers in the heartless kingdom. Heartless kingdom. What does that mean? It's the earthly kingdom. Think about it. Think about the kingdom of Pharaoh in Egypt. Heartless. Heartless. They could do anything, tear lives apart, tear families apart, destroy people, heartless kingdom. Think about the Assyrian kingdom and see what they did to the people they captured. Heartless, heartless kingdom. Think about Babylon, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Is this not the kingdom that I have built for the honor of my name? And he raised up an idol and he said, everybody should worship that idol. And he said, if anyone refuses to worship that idol that same hour i'll cast them into the furnace of fire and we're told about shadrach meshach and abednego he heard of them he called them is it true what i'm hearing are you not worshiping my idol now i give you a second chance if at the moment you hear the music of idolatry if you bow down bend down fall down worship that's all right i give you another chance but if you don't, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? He said, O king, hold your breath. I will not answer you anything. If you do that, like heartless emperors of empires do, there's a God in heaven, it he will deliver us from your heart. That man got angry. He didn't think of their, of their lives, he didn't think of the pain, did not think about anything. Hit that funny is seven times more. Throw them inside. What does he care about? Anybody suffering? Anybody crying? Anybody having pain? Heartless kingdom. And think about the Roman, the Roman government or the Middle Persian government, all of them, they're like that, with their iron boots, they trample upon people and trample upon their rights. The kingdoms of this world are heartless kingdoms and there are strangers to the grace of God foreigners to the grace of God living in that heartless kingdom and they take the nature of the kingdom in which they live the foreigners and the strangers in the heartless kingdom we're looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 2 reading from verse 12 it says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then the first part of verse 19, now therefore ye who have repented, ye who have been reconciled to God, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. There are those who have not repented. They are still strangers and foreigners. Point number two, then the foreigners and strangers in the heartless kingdom. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the foreign strangers with no hope of heaven. Number two, the filthy sinners with no heart for heaven. Number three, the false saints with no habitation in heaven. Number one, the foreign strangers with no hope of heaven. It tells us that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12, that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, 
and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Without God in the world. Psalm 10, we're reading from verse 4. In Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked, those are the strangers, foreigners, no hope of heaven, the wicked, through the pride of his, of his countenance, will not seek after God. Look at this. God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to act. God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to fight. God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to practice a personal principle. That's who I am. That's what I'm going to do. Let them cry. Let them uh, crawl. Let them prostrate. Let them do anything. This is what I am going to do. God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to carry out his dubious business. What does he care about God? God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to oppress. He wants to ill treat anyone. Does he care? No, because God is not in all his thoughts. And that's why we need to check our own lives. If we say we're born again in the things we do, is God in our thoughts? In the places we go, is God in our thoughts? In the principles we carry out, whether in the church or in the office, anywhere, is God in our thoughts? In our getting married or getting, uh, you know, young fellows to marry our sons, young fellows to marry our daughter. Do we think about God or are we like the wicked? I'm born again, I'm born again, but God is not in all his thoughts. Those people are foreigners to the kingdom. They're strangers to the kingdom. They're strangers to the goodness of God. If we are born again, God must be in our thoughts. I must say, God listens to every conversation. And God hears everything I say. And God observes everything I do. Look at Isaiah chapter 57. And we're reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 10. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet said thou not, there is no hope. Thou has found the life of thine hand. And it says, therefore, thou was not grieved. Other people suffer. They are not grieved. Other people are hungry. They are not grieved. Other people miss the regular things they should have in life. Since they are all right and they are satisfied and they have all the things they want, it doesn't matter to them what happens to other people. Therefore, thou was not great. It tells us in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And of whom hast thou been afraid of fear, that thou hast lied, and hast not remembered me, that was lied and has not remembered me. You know why people lie? There's no God in their thoughts. They don't understand the character, the characteristics of the kingdom citizens. All they think about, I must save my face. I must protect myself. I mustn't say, I did that, I did that restitution. Uh -uh. If I do restitution, properly and thoroughly and with all implication i will I, I want to save my face they are afraid of what man will say what man will do it says of whom must thou been afraid of fear that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me nor laid it to thine heart have i not held my peace even of old and Thou fearest me not, 
those are the people that do not have hope of heaven because God is not in their thoughts. In Jeremiah chapter 18, reading from verse 12, Jeremiah 18 verse 12, and they said, there's no hope. Repent, there's no hope. Be ye reconciled unto God, there's no hope. Turn around, Christ died for you. Live a righteous life. There is no hope. They've gone so far, they don't believe that the grace of God and the goodness of God can come to them and transform their lives. There is no hope. Why don't you come to the Lord and then you live a transformed life? Old dog cannot learn a new trick. Look at my age and look at how I am now. I'm entrenched into that evil habit already. I cannot learn any new lifestyle. The grace of God can do it. They say, no, there is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices. And we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Those are foreigners to the kingdom and foreigners to the kingdom of God and foreigners to the covenant of Israel, foreigners to the covenant of God, no change of life because there's no hope. Look at number two. Number two, we're looking at filthy sinners with no heart for heaven. When you have heart for something, even though you've not got it, you pursue, you pray, you want to possess, you want to have, but when you don't have heart for that thing, they're religious, but they don't have heart for heaven, heart for goodness, heart for godliness. The filthy sinners with no heart for heaven. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And then in verse 19, it says in verse 19, who have been past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work, to work, to work all on cleanness with greediness. They do not think about heaven. All they do is that all they, their hope is only in this world. And they do not have any heart for heaven, any desire for heaven. The present pleasure of the flesh is all the desire. Meaningless thing, meaningless life. Because they are not thinking of the future. It tells us about them, about them in Jude reading from verse 8. Jude has one chapter. Jude chapter 1 verse 8. Likewise also these feel the dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. They don't have any heart for heaven and any hope of heaven. And so whatever they can do here, they can slash down somebody, cut down somebody, cut off somebody. They can do anything to injure or to derail anyone. What's their business? What's their purpose? What's their goal? There's nothing in heaven they're looking for. Because of that, they feel the dreamers. They despise dominion. They speak evil of dignities. In verse 13, verse 13 tells us, reaching waves of the sea, forming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I pray we'll have hope of heaven. Amen. Amen. We'll have heart for heaven. I will have habitation in heaven. I will have habitation in heaven. Come to number three here. Number three, the false saints with no habitation 
in heaven. We're coming back to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, not once since you were born again and the people were speaking to in the house fellowship we're not just having a you know house fellowship what if christ comes after that house fellowship what if the trumpet sounds after that house fellowship after that service after that gathering after that assembly where will our audience and members where will they be what if after today after we listen to all we're listening to what if christ comes where will you spend eternity and so as you teach other people as you lead other people you're thinking of christ will come anytime you know if you've been waiting and then christ has not come that's how the people of noah's day that's how they were waiting and i was saying the rain is coming the flood is coming I had that before, we had that before One day it came That's how they were at the time of Lord The fire will come and devour all unrighteous people And it seemed to his people as somebody joking, jesting But the fire came and Jesus said Remember Lord's wife We've been talking about the coming of the Lord one day or one night or one morning or somewhere, sometime, uh, He will come. The point is, are we ready? Or are we called saints and courts, brothers and sisters in courts, and then the life of the saint, the commitment, consecration of the saint is not in us. Are we conscious of that character? those characteristics that commitment that consecration every moment every time the false saints will have no habitation in heaven ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 3 of fornication and all ungodliness un ungodliness in every form every shape or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints and then in verse 4 in verse 4 neither filthiness no foolish talking no jesting which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks verse 5 in verse 5 for this ye know that no monger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance, has any inheritance, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Isaiah chapter 65. And I'm reading from verse 5. I say, chapter 65, reading from verse 5, which says, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. On what grounds? On what basis? On the grounds of my religion. Stand by yourself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. On what grounds I am circumcised? And, and you are not circumcised. The Jews, those Pharisees, stand by yourself. Don't come near me, for I am holier than thou. On what grounds? On the grounds of dressing. Stand by yourself. Don't come near me. I am holier than thou because I don't wear this and you wear that. Stand by yourself. On what grounds our church denomination is the best in the whole nation? And I belong to that denomination. Do you have the salvation? 
the new birth, the sanctification, the consecration, and the transparent lifestyle of the true believer. I belong to that denomination. Uh -huh. So stand by yourself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. The Lord hates pretense. He hates hypocritical profession. He hates that kind of falsehood as saints. Titus chapter 1 verse 16. In Titus chapter 1 verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. We're coming to point number three. In point number three, we have the foundation of our security in the heavenly kingdom. The foundation of our security in the heavenly kingdom. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19. In verse 19 it says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God. In verse 20 it says, And we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ. Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, number one, the foundation of Christ as revealed by the apostles and the prophets. Number two, the foundation of the cornerstone, the apostle, the prophet. Number three, the foundation of commitment and addiction to purity look at number one number one the foundation of christ as revealed by his apostles and prophets in ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 it says a built upon the foundation one foundation of the apostles and the prophets the apostles and the prophets and the plural but they lay the same foundation the apostles that lived at that time quite a number of them apostles to the jews apostles to the gentiles and the prophets in the plural they lay the same foundation it says were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone look at verse 21 in verse 21 in whom that's in christ all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the lord verse 22 in verse 22 in whom he also are built together for an habitation of god he says I will come into them. I will walk in them. I will live in them. And it says in whom also ye are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The apostles and the prophets, they declared Christ at the foundation. And now we are built on that foundation. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed Christ now revealed the foundation now revealed the cornerstone now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by 
his spirit. All those apostles that went out, all those prophets that went out declaring the same thing, that salvation is only found in Christ. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. It tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 2 that she may be mindful of the words which were spoken before. Which were spoken before of the holy prophets and of the commandments of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. They took the words of the Savior. They took the sacrifice of the Savior. They took the declarations of the Savior and they declared to the whole world those apostles and the prophets. And then in verse 14, in verse 14 it says, Wherefore, beloved, See ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him in peace. That's what all the prophets and the, and the apostles said, without sport. That's what all the prophets and the apostles emphasized, and blameless. That's what all those prophets and all the apostles, that's what they said. Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, and he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers in verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints. The apostles and the prophets, holy apostles, holy prophets, here is their goal. Here is the reason for ministry, the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. The words of those apostles and the words of those prophets, we keep on reading them, we keep on meditating on them, we keep on believing them, we keep on embracing them, we keep on living by them until, and we keep on declaring to other people until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I pray God will effect that in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to number two here. Number two, the foundation of the cornerstone, the apostle, that cornerstone, the apostle, that cornerstone, the prophet, the cornerstone, Christ the apostle the saint one because every time he said my father sent me that's being uh, the apostolic and the prophet a prophet like unto thee moses will i give unto them i'll put my word in his mouth the cornerstone is the great apostle the cornerstone is the great high priest. The cornerstone is the great prophet. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 6 the cornerstone wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures behold i lay in zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth on him on that cornerstone shall not be confounded then in hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 Wherefore holy brethren saints partakers of the heavenly calling 
consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Consider Christ, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, the apostle and the high priest of our profession is Jesus Christ. Verse 2, in verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Then he tells us the condition of our belonging to him in verse 6. In verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? Whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Sage, sustained, steadfast in the Lord, and moving on in the Lord, we hold fast. Are you holding fast today? As you did 10, 20 years ago, are you holding fast? Is the word of God having effect in your life today? As the word had effect when you're first born again. Are you holding fast your conviction? Like in the earlier days when you were persecuted and you stood firm. We only become and we only stand as partakers of that kingdom if we hold fast that hope until the end in verse 14 in verse 14 for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end I pray we remain steadfast unto the end in Jesus name Acts chapter 3 verse 22 Acts chapter 3 verse 22 for Moses truly said unto the fathers a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he, he shall say unto you, understand? Whatsoever he shall say unto you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He said the word revealed the revelation of heaven. And then he went to heaven. This is Acts of the Apostles. And those apostles still held on to the word that he spoke when he was on earth. There are some so-called believers. They said they are Paul's followers. And so they only read, they only study the epistles of Paul. They say Paul said so, the apostle to the Gentiles. Whatever Christ said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, he spoke about self-denial. No, that's before the cross. He spoke about bearing your cross. They say, that's before the cross. He spoke about following me and walking in the light and not walking in darkness. Oh, they say that's, that's at that time before Pentecost. It says, a prophet, like unto me, what the Lord your God raised up unto you. Of your brethren, like unto me, him Christ shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. That's why Jesus said, All power in heaven and on earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the, of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, even after that Holy Ghost has come 
after the ch church has been planted, after the church has been established, after the Holy Ghost continues to reveal the mind of the Father unto you, after raising of Paul, after raising of Silas, after raising of Timothy, after raising of the rest of them, at that time, until the end of time, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you until the end of the world. So, all the words of Christ, the apostle, the prophet, the cornerstone, the savior, the teacher come from heaven, we keep on obeying his word. Look at verse 23. It says in verse 23, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet referring to Christ shall be destroyed from among the people anyone that will use the excuse well uh, this is what Paul said and I'm following after Paul I will not hear Christ the cornerstone the apostle the prophet and he will gloss over he is living now in the age of grace and grace you know accepts everything whatever comes whatever goes grace 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 and jesus said he that shall endure to the end the same shall be saved if anyone will not hear Christ, he shall be destroyed from among the people. Verse 24. In verse 24, it says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise spoken, foretold of these days. Verse 25. And it says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy sea shall all the king, kindreds of the earth be blessed. Verse 26 now tells us what Christ has come to do, and what Christ has done, and what Christ is still doing unto you first. God have been raised up his son Jesus and sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquities. I pray the ministry and the ministration of Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the apostle, the prophet, will take effect in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Point number uh, three, we're coming to this, the foundation of commitment and addiction to purity. It tells us the foundation on which we now build and the foundation of our lives. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19, it says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Everyone that names the name of Christ, let him depart, let her depart from iniquity. That is the foundation that we know God and God knows us and we're built an habitation of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 21, in verse 21, it tells us, if a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, if we're going to be vessels unto honor, there will be that sanctification of the heart, that purification of the heart, that cleansing of the heart, that total change and the total turning around of the heart. There must be that removal or protein of the stony heart and the implanting of the tender, gentle, salt, 
meek heart that the Lord gives us a heart like unto Christ's, unto that which Christ had. If anyone purge himself, herself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, a meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work and then in verse 22 it says flee also youthful laws but follow righteousness faith charity peace with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart out of a sanctified heart out of a holy heart out of a transparent heart the people that call upon god their lives and their experiences are built on the cornerstone on the foundation on the apostle and prophet of our faith our forerunner it tells us in psalm 24 psalm 24 reading from verse 3 in psalm 24 verse 3 who shall ascend into the hill of the lord or who shall stand in his holy place look at verse 4 he that has clean hands he that has clean hands the thief does not have clean hands the one taking things from the office or things from his place of work without the consent of the director or the leader there he doesn't have clean hands the one that is pilfering and stealing that one is small that one is small he does not have clean hands the one that is stealing money from anywhere whether from church or outside the church, he doesn't have clean hands. If he dies in that condition, his life is not on the foundation. He has no hope. He has no heart for heaven. He has no habitation in heaven. The one who is going to get to heaven is a serious-minded saint of God whose hands are clean. He has clean hands and a pure heart. The heart is pure. The heart is purified. The heart is prepared for heaven. He's conscious about that every time. He's not a superficial, secular worshiper that is just coming to church and is just answering, I'm a member, I'm a member, and he doesn't have the experience of the pure heart. Who shall get to that heavenly place? It says he or she that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity and who has not sworn deceitfully matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 8 in matthew chapter 5 verse 8 blessed are the pure in heart those are the words of christ he knew that we must have it's not just i'm forgiving i'm forgiving every time falling into sin oh lord remember your grace remember your grace and then he comes out of there the following day is back into the is back into the dust again and he's swallowing in the mire again oh god remember your grace remember your grace and the following week again is back into sin is back into defilement is back into evil oh lord I remember your grace not those people those people are not serious of their souls. The people who are going to get to heaven and the people who are going to be rewarded on that final day, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I pray you will see God. I will see God. I will see God. And therefore you are there. And when the word of God is coming, you're serious with that word. You receive that word. You accept that word. And you know that is the word of God. And whatever you do, whatever you have, whoever you are, if you don't have that purity of heart, you know that it's going to be tragic and traumatic forever and ever because Christ the final word of God has given us his word blessed at the pure in heart for they shall see God and Titus chapter 2 reading from verse 11 Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation 
The grace of God doesn't bring excuse for sinfulness. The grace of God doesn't bring us into more sin, more sin, and more loss of the flesh. The grace of God brings salvation, and it has appeared unto men. In verse 12, it says, it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world and then in verse 13 it says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ in verse 14 who gave himself for us he gave himself for you I said he gave himself for you. Why? That you may remain frivolous, careless, joking, jesting, a nuisance, somebody who does not actually count Calvary serious. What did he give himself for you? He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works somebody shout amen. amen when christ comes into our lives he brings righteousness it brings holiness we love that holiness and we enjoy that holiness and want to live every moment of our lives as long as Christ is there in the heart your heart will be passionate about that because he gave himself that he might redeem you from all iniquity and then he said and purify unto himself a peculiar people you will not be an ordinary person, you will not be like every dick and hurry, you not be like a person that you know just like everybody else there's no distinction there's no specialty there's no peculiarity when Christ saves you and Christ purifies you and Christ sanctifies you he makes you a peculiar person even other believers around you will see that your zeal for the Lord your dependence upon the Lord your commitment to the Lord and your consecration to the Lord and the way you carry out your life you are sold out to God and God alone and you will not be campaigning for uh, let's take it easy let's take it normal let's take it uh, you know average are we the only people in the world of course yes we are the peculiar people of the Lord and we are zealous for good works and the people of the world are zealous for what they are doing and they are passionate about what they are doing and all their heart, all their soul, all their mind is into what they are doing when Christ lives on the inside of us, it was written of him, the zeal of the Lord has consumed me. The same thing to be said of you, the zeal of the Lord has consumed you. You'll be a peculiar person, a peculiar sage, a peculiar child of God, a peculiar man, a peculiar woman, a peculiar worker, a peculiar saint, a peculiar minister, a peculiar preacher. You'll be zealous of good works and when the zeal is like fire burning and when that fire is burning within your soul the people far away and the people nearby they will see the fire they will see the zeal you will not be lukewarm you will not just be so so Christian so so worker and then you crawl in and then you crawl out and you are not making any difference anywhere there is fire you will see the effect of the fire there and if the fire of faith is burning in your heart and he has saved you and sanctified you and he makes you a peculiar person zealous of good works everybody will see the fire burning today the fire will start burning in your heart, in your life in the work of your hand the fire will be burning in Jesus name others will see it where are you? the fire will burn in your life why don't you just stand up and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready for the heavenly fire, Pentecostal fire, to come down upon my life. 
born and born every chaff away and all this uh, lethargy born everything away all this sluggishness born everything away I want to be a peculiar saint a peculiar child of God a peculiar worker a peculiar sage a peculiar servant of God and I want your fire to burn in my life let it burn let it burn let it burn and you come to the Lord as citizens and uh, the members of the family of God in the kingdom of God open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer talk to the Lord in prayer you know, God knows our hearts. He knows if we're praying seriously. He knows if we're superficial. He knows if we're in a hurry. He knows if we're just a nuisance in the house of God. He knows if we're committed unto the Lord. He knows if we take Calvary serious. If we take the sacrifice of Christ, he knows if we take that serious. He knows if it is something in us that Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He knows. Tell him, Lord, I want to move higher. I want to live in the brighter light of the kingdom. I don't want to be a so so Christian. A so so believer. A so so servant of God. I don't want to be a foreigner. Foreigner to grace. Foreigner to godliness. I don't want to be a foreigner. I don't want to be a stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, to the covenant of promise. I don't want to be a stranger. I want to have the real knowledge experiential knowledge of Christ who died for me of Christ who washed away my sin by the blood of a sacrifice I want to have a present day knowledge of the presence of God in my life I want to have the work of grace established in my life. The grace for sanctification. The grace for holiness. The grace for purity of heart and purity of life. I want that reflected in my thoughts, in my plans, in my practice. In the things I do everywhere, anywhere. The sincerity of hope, the certainty of hope. I don't want to live an empty life that has no hope of heaven. Shallow life that doesn't have any heart for heaven, double minded life that does not have uh, any habitation in heaven. I don't want my profession of Christian faith to be just an outward expression I want grace to influence my inner life I want the grace of God to show in the conversion in the transformation of my inner life totally dependent upon the Lord 
yielded without any reservation unto the Lord. I want to demonstrate my call to being a sage. I want to show the character, the characteristics of saints or citizens of his kingdom. I want to have the consecration, the commitment of a real saint, a real servant, a real steward of the mysteries of the kingdom. Focused, fixed, my heart is fixed to oh Lord, my heart is fixed. I want to be conscious of that thick middle wall of partition broken down between me and the Lord. I sense the reconciliation. I sense the righteousness. I sense the redemption, the life that follows after the Lord without any separation between me and the Almighty. I let that book cleanse, let that blood purge. Let that blood purify. Let the fire burn every chaff. Every unprofitable habit. And let the strength of the Lord support and lift you up higher than where you are being higher than what your life had been in the past and all that hypocritical make-believe telling others I'm holier than thou all that pride. All that religious thought that makes anyone smoke fire to God. Let's get rid of all that and have a present day experience of holiness, of sanctification, of purity, recognized by heaven. Let's go back to the foundation. The foundation revealed by the apostles and the prophets. All that Christ gave to them, all that Christ preached, all that Christ emphasized, and they have given unto us. Let's go back to that foundation. The foundation of Christ, the cornerstone. 
other foundation can no man lay than that which is already laid, Christ. Savior, Christ. Sanctifier, Christ. The baptizer and the Holy Ghost, Christ. The healer, Christ. The coming King. They will soon come. We don't know the hour. We don't know the day. It will soon come yet. Remember Lord's word. Live for him. Live by His power. Live for His glory. Every moment. In things common and uncommon. In things habitual, occasional. Live for Him. In things observable or invisible labor for him let his grace abide in your life every time godly holily soberly righteously Go beyond religion. Live and labor for Him with all your heart. With all your soul, with all your mind, no reservation, no rivals, no retreat, live for the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. And the people of God said, yeah. Father, we thank you for your revelation to our hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We appreciate, we're grateful for the sacrifice you made on the cross of Calvary. All the pain you went through, suffering you went through. So, as to bring us to God, reconciled unto God, and so as to break down the middle wall of partition, now that we can have a free way, a free cause unto the Heavenly Father. Thank you for receiving us. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you for bringing us into your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that the grace to show gratitude every time for everything you've done in our lives, bringing us in the kingdom, establishing us in the kingdom. Give us the grace to manifest that gratitude in Jesus' name. We we'll pray as we move on in life and we we'll see foreigners, strangers to the kingdom, the people that have no hope, no heart, no habitation for in heaven we pray you will draw us with compassion and with mercy unto them to bring them into the kingdom of God in Jesus name make us fruitful faithful 
and Father, it's so winners in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, our consecration and commitment will not be on the decline, decreasing, but it will be increasing every time in Jesus' name. And we pray that all the virtues of the kingdom, the love in the kingdom, the power of the kingdom, everything will be seen, visible in our lives in Jesus' name. Give us, Lord, transformed, transparent lives that will follow you without any regret, follow you without any reservation, and follow you without anyone to rival our love for you in Jesus' name. Make us pure. Keep us pure. Make us peculiar people. And keep us peculiar people. And Lord, help us not to be lukewarm, not to be cold, not to be lethargic, but to have the zeal of Christ consuming us every time in Jesus' name. As we go, go with us. This week, coming week, make us fruitful. Let the fire of the Spirit be burning in every heart. And your work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We will not look back we will not be like we had been. Upward, forward, for everyone, in Jesus' name. The glory of God go with you. And the blessings of the Lord go with you. Turn to the right, turn to the left, turn forward everywhere. The power of God will be confirmed in your life. And this gospel will bear fruit in you, bear fruit in your family, and bear fruit in a local church, and your house fellowship will come alive in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing, confirmation in every life. In Jesus' name we pray.